Nothing else but cooking <laughs> and recovering, sort of recovering from the Harvard PhD. Um, I've never actually recovered. As close as I can. Anyways, back to the research stuff. Um, so I'm gonna be talking today uh, mostly to systems people, but I've made a mistake and I made this talk to a bit more generic uh, audiences and they sort of all the way through the talk. So I'll try to spend the first half of the talk sort of to present um, motivating applications um, that motivate all the development of platforms and, and system services. Uh, and then the second half of the talk will be a bit more systems oriented on, on our one of our new platforms that we developed in Cyro uh, and um, sort of the uh, mechanisms that we developed to improve communication and computation. <coughs> of sensor network platforms. So Jeff gave you a bit of, uh, of an overview of where I'm uh, located at the moment. Uh, so I work for CSIRO, uh, which stands for Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. Uh, it's the largest uh, research organization government funded in Australia. Uh, it's been it's gone back in history for quite a long time. They started originally working on um, in astronomy, they were uh, developing satellite dishes and astronomical observations. There's a movie about it, it's called The Dish. If people are interested in seeing it, it's quite a funny movie. Uh, but at the moment we have around 6,000 employees, a lot of people with PhDs, uh, uh, organized in, in different divisions, scientific divisions, many people looking at mining industry, minerals, um, many people studying oceans, climate, ecologists, and our division is uh, relatively small within CSIRO, it's only around 300 people and it's called Information Communication Technologies. Uh, we are, in particular, our lab is one of the four labs in this division, is located in Brisbane, which is sort of halfway through no south north in Australia, really nice weather, it never snows, <laughs> it's the coldest I've felt in the last two years. Um, and it's uh, just a little bit of uh, driving distance from the Craigberry Reef, so uh, there's great stuff to see on the water there as well. Um, so again, the lab that I'm working at is called Autonomous Systems, and it sort of merges two related areas. One of them is the field robotics. We have guys that are working with these uh, autonomous vehicles from ground to marine to UAVs. Uh, it's quite impressive, actually. These vehicles are quite big. You have this huge hot metal carrier, and it just autonomously drives around the campus, uh, working on different tasks. Uh, and so that's about two-thirds of the lab, and then about one-third is working in pervasive computing, which formerly was called sensor networks. Um, and so the area of interest of our group or of the team within the lab is uh, uh, in this, again, autonomously operating uh, network systems that span um, spatially quite large areas uh, that have no infrastructure, so they have to self-organize, they have to look over multiple hopes, self-communicate the information and deliver it to the user in a useful form. Uh, CISIRO is actually quite well known in the sensor networks community for a number of deployments. Uh, historically, there was a lot of interest in just in microclimate uh, type networks. Uh, we have. Uh, one deployment that I'll show you in a later slide that we've been operating now for almost three years where we have 250 sensors deployed in the rainforest and it's been now delivering data to biologists who studied at rainforest over three years. Uh, then we also <coughs> moved from just uh, the stationary deployment into cattle tracking and other agricultural applications. This was actually quite exciting. Uh, compared to the stationary network, so it requires new protocols to handle the mo uh, mobility. It still operates in environments with no infrastructure. So you need to provide your own networking, your own uh, charging capabilities. Uh, we have uh, sensors that we put on collars 
of the cattle that can sort of track the location of the cattle. Uh, we also have a way of controlling the movement of the cattle through little electric uh, other stockers uh, that can turn the cattle around and so it allows the farmers to draw a virtual line instead of putting a physical fence to constrain where the cattle is grazing. We also put uh, sensors inside animals. Uh, we designed these nodes that uh, we have the cattle uh, to swallow and they're measuring uh, sort of uh, CO2 methane type of uh, greenhouse gases uh, so that farmers can correlate the food that the animals are eating to the amount of greenhouse gases emissions they are producing and, and develop better techniques uh, in the agriculture industry. And more recently we also moved into urban spaces uh, we've been looking at energy efficiency in buildings in uh, sort of strategies of, or uh, usage patterns of how people are using appliances or uh, we were also looking or are looking into ways of uh, controlling HVAC systems in an intelligent way um, that would reflect uh, the occupation of the building uh, by the people, um, occupants, sorry, or uh, the thermal comfort of the individuals present in the buildings. <clears throat> okay, so what now I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll give you uh, an overview of a couple of these projects. Uh, one is the, uh, the Spring Group project uh, to give you an idea of the scope um, and the scale of this project. And then I'll follow up uh, in two projects that we started about three months ago, new and exciting. So. Uh, so back to the Spring Group project, um, uh, we started, this is a video that is sort of prepared to present the project. Uh, so we started to look into this area in uh, southern Queensland, uh, where uh, there's this piece of land which has been used for the past hundred years for agriculture. There used to be a rainforest there, uh, which was important ecologically. And uh, with the growing ecological movement, the government is providing a lot of funding to buy out the agricultural land and restore the environment to its original state. And so, oops. We just started. So we work with ecologists that sort of got this land from the government um, close, to the, close to the coast. It's an interesting area uh, spatially. So we, this is the deployment of around 250 nodes in about few by few kilometers uh, area. It's an interesting area uh, because if you look at the elevation map, it's quite varied. And then so if you look at the climate, with a small distance, with a small spatial distance in the environment, you get large variation in the climate. There are areas which are sunny and warm, and 100 meters away, it could be really cold and rainy. And uh, so originally, the, the biologists were using satellite data with coarse resolution. With sensors, we allow them to see this kind of data where you sort of see in a very detailed way the temperature or humidity or soil moisture uh, gradients. And then they can sort of plug that into their uh, models with which they model how the plants are growing. Uh, they have different areas in this space uh, where they are trying different strategies to bring back the original native plant, uh, and, and then they are studying uh, which methods are working better than the others. These are just uh, examples of some of the sensors that we deployed. It's all autonomous, powered by the solar panels, uh, and all waterproof. It's actually quite impressive. We sort of stopped any sort of maintenance <coughs> about a year ago, and it's been working, it's, I think, it's still about 95 person nodes working with no maintenance over the past year at all. Um, so, uh, this was sort of the, there wasn't really any commercial application in here. It was more of a technology demonstrator and we helped the ecologists to study uh, some of their um, techniques. But uh, what you can do and what we started applying uh, this technology to this year is uh, mine rehabilitation. So, there were some mining people who seen presentations with our uh, system working and uh, it turned out that they had this huge problem that uh, part of the contract with the government, so the government, the way it works in Australia is that mining companies are leasing the land where there are ores or other uh, resources they're mining for. 
part of the agreement is uh, that they are paying for the lease, but also at the end of the mining operation, they need to restore the environment to the original state. And no one defines how this process is supposed to be working. They just need to convince one of the, um, uh, one of the government officials that the, um, the environment is healthy and is going to be able to continue growing for the years to come. Uh, until they convince them, they have to keep paying the lease uh, for the land. And uh, at the moment, they are using biologists to estimate how the, uh, um, or to predict how the environment is going to be happening. But they wanted to have the wood sensor networks allow them to do is they can quantify a bit more uh, how the um, uh, what will be the outcome of the rehabilitation, and uh, potentially they you know they can if, if they can project uh, the growth of the forest. Uh, with small error over a number of years, potentially it will lead them to sign of the site rehabilitation better uh, and uh, faster and save resources. Uh, also, uh, if you have more detailed data from the environment, you can you can um, uh, sort of proactively discover if there are problems. If part of the soil is not uh, suitable for a given plant species, you can address the problem before it's too late, before any years from now the whole uh, forest sort of ties off. <clears throat> so here is sort of the process that we are following. Uh, this was, there is a system that was developed by the Australian Department of Energy Management, and they were using satellite weather data to predict, uh, using some sort of simulator to predict rehabilitation outcome and produce a report card that mining companies could use to convince the government. The variation or the accuracy of this weather satellite data was not very high, so they had a huge variance on the input data, which uh, resulted in a large variance in, in the outcomes. And so the hope is that when you uh, replace that um, coarse grain data from the satellite, when you replace it with the fine grain data, just as I showed you in the uh, spring group, you'll be able to predict with a much better accuracy and confidence what will happen <coughs> uh, with your uh, ecosystems in the future. And uh, here is the status. We have around 25 nodes deployed, and so the biologists can already sort of start downloading the data uh, and look at it. So this is just an example of uh, how sometimes a uh, technology demonstrated project can lead to an industrial application that gives, brings you funding uh, from industry. Another example uh, that we also coincidentally started three months ago uh, is a uh, long-term tracking of flying foxes. Flying foxes are these large bats, uh, fruit bats. So they are nocturnal animals. They live during the day or they are active during the night. They sleep throughout the day. Uh, they are huge. They are beautiful animals. And, you know, I was telling Murat, me and my wife often have um, dinner at, on the balcony and then we just look at the city. Brisbane city and you see this huge stream of these vampires that are descending on the city and spreading around and eating mangoes, luckily mangoes. Um, and so <clears throat> it turned out that there are a lot of problems in Australia associated uh, with these uh, with flying foxes, with these bats. Uh, and uh, they are native species and all native species, both uh, animal and plant, are protected in Australia. You can't kill them, you can't remove them, uh, you need to get a special permits to sort of change their natural uh, distribution. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the special problem with flying foxes is that people don't really know too much about them. Um, so the reasons why to track them is that um, they cause some diseases. Uh, I think they can spread diseases such as Ebola. The one that was uh, actually in the news in Australia recently is called Hendra virus that spreads from flying foxes to horses uh, through feces. So the flying foxes are eating fruits, uh, are defecating under the trees. Horses come, they eat the grass, they get sick, uh, and then horses die, which is one of, you know, it, it's a lot of damage in terms of the horse industry, but also the disease can then spread to humans. There are a couple of deaths in Australia, so it became a politically uh, important sort of project, and there was all of a sudden governmental funding to study flying foxes. <coughs> uh, the problem with flying foxes is that uh, uh, they cover huge areas in Australia, so they, they sort of 
live almost everywhere. This is the distribution of four different species of flying foxes in Australia and continues all the way to Asia. Um, and uh, they cover large distances every night and they live this nomadic um, uh, uh, lifestyle where they sort of stay in one camp during the day for about a week and then they move somewhere else. And so the, it happens oftentimes that um, uh, people see flying foxes in their garden for a week and then they all, they all disappear. And so people start complaining, oh, all the flying foxes are dying off, whereas the farmer next door gets all the flying foxes coming. In. So he's complaining, oh, there are all these flying foxes, we should be killing them. No one really understands uh, whether they are endangered or whether they should be culling them. And uh, so uh, the ecologists proposed this national flying fox tracking program where uh, they, we would deploy a number of devices, uh, GPS tracking devices on them uh, that would let us study uh, in a better way of how they're using the habitat, what are the individual interactions between flying foxes, and how they interact with farm animals. <coughs> uh, they managed to get a lot of uh, funding from the government for the deployment, and then we managed to get CSIRO funding to develop the technology. Uh, there are a number of challenges. Obviously, the flying fox is, even though it has a one meter wingspan, its uh, weight is limited. So, which limits the weight of the device that we can, uh, we can put on them to 30 to 50 grams. I already mentioned the mobility, they travel large distances during the night, which our algorithms need to be able to handle. It's a truly remote deployment. They expect them to be crossing between Indonesia and Thailand and never come back, and potentially some of those animals coming back, but not all of them. So we need to try to uh, use the fact that uh, they are meeting somewhere out, outside of our uh, cover zone, and yet they should be able to speak, bring the data back from other flying foxes possibly as well. And also longe uh, longevity, um, we are constrained by the size of the device, so the battery that we can put on these collars is quite limited, so we were thinking of how to um, uh, harvest some energy on the way to sort of enable perpetual function of these devices. So when we decided on the platform, uh, we decided to put other sensors than GPS on the platform, mostly because we didn't pay much for the, for the additional sensors in ter terms of weight, uh, and uh, we chose uh, sensors that are relatively cheap to run in terms of the energy. Uh, and what then lets us, uh, let the sensor lets us do is um, we can uh, detect activities of the flying foxes and then find locations of activities as opposed to just periodic locations of uh, over their lifetime. Uh, for connectivity, we decided to use a low-power uh, 900 megahertz radio that's sort of customary for sensor network deployments. Uh, this is as opposed to 3G chips, uh, which uh, are heavy and still uh, require large energy usage, uh, or uh, satellite uh, chips that have sort of nice coverage but are also expensive in terms of bandwidth and energy. Uh, and I already mentioned we were aiming for we are aiming for perpetual operation using uh, solar energy harvesting. The research question that we are sort of uh, looking at from ICT perspective is first of uh, first of all how does the mobility uh, influence uh, the data that we are using, such as GPS location, radio communication, solar harvesting. Uh, and stepping a uh, step higher from these basic modalities is how do we combine inputs from multiple different sensors, such as, for example, GPS, inertial audio, uh, to detect activity, type, and location. Uh, and finally, can we learn by observing the uh, interaction patterns of the different flying foxes, can we learn something about their social dynamics and then apply uh, this knowledge uh, to improve, improve information return in terms of ICT algorithms from, from these devices. So how do we uh, set up our routing protocol, data moving protocols, compression protocols, so that we maximize information return. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's early stages uh, of the project, so we only so far did uh, very basic testing. Uh, we purchased a whole bunch of UAVs uh, from Germany uh, that let us do controlled experiments with uh, mobility. 
3D mobility. Uh, one of the results that we expected was that the speed of, um, uh, of the device or the relative speed of two communication devices <coughs> doesn't influence much uh, the, the radius. So here on the, on the x-axis, uh, I'm showing the range between the base station and the mobile node. On the y-axis, I'm showing the signal strength of the radio signal. And the different colors correspond to different speeds. Blue is 0 to 2 meters per second, and 2 to 4, and then above 4. And we couldn't really see <coughs> any dependence on the speed, which was a good thing for us. Uh, we have also uh, looked at the GPS lock time. How long does it take for GPS to get a lock after on x-axis is uh, how uh, long the GPS was turned off. So depending on that, GPS has to go either to the, to the call star or the long star. And the good news was that we could lock the GPS uh, in about 5 to 15 seconds, no matter how. It was a growing tendency, but uh, it was still acceptable. And then we also looked at uh, how much energy we can harvest on a node uh, which was attached to a flying fox, as opposed to a node that was uh, just stationary placed on the ground. Uh, obviously, throughout the day, towards the evening, the energy on the ground goes down. You see here the spike, this was in a cage, as the sun was sort of uh, casting the, the cage bars or casting shadow on the solar panel. You could see the spikes. Uh, it looks uh, like uh, we could harvest very little energy, but even with this little energy we calculated, we can do half an hour uh, periodic fix from GPS throughout the whole day. So it was again encouraging results. Uh, I also have early data processing results uh, where we were able to detect uh, some activities from inertial data. So here uh, on the x-axis is basically time, y-axis shows the values coming from the accelerometer um, and the activities that we were able to detect is uh, it's really interesting. Although expected, uh, most of the time the flying foxes are hanging upside down in the camp, uh, but when they want to urinate or defecate, obviously they turn around. Um, and so it's really easy to detect that. It's a simple algorithm to detect that. Fighting also, we can distinguish it quite well from the resting uh, period. We estimate we'll be able to detect mating, uh, but we haven't really observed that yet. Privacy issue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, privacy issue. <laughs> Uh, also, we looked at the microphone track. So we have these uh, microphones that we can sample uh, with uh, up to 16 kilohertz on the mode, on the on the tag, and we were able to uh, using simple parameters such as zero crossing, which are basically a proxy for frequency in frequency, and also mean sound level and duration. We were able to distinguish uh, uh, the calls that the flying fox is making. Um, Okay, so that's it with the cool slides. Non-systems people can go back to sleep, <laughs> or can go to sleep uh, because I'm switching to the systems part. So hopefully I've convinced you that um, <clears throat> we've done a lot of deployments in the real world and that uh, making these systems work for long periods of time, unattended, is a challenging problem due to different things, most of all, uh, that we, there is a complex and time varying relationship between the environment um, sort of interfering on your system and the system performance. <coughs> uh, and uh, so the lessons learned from this deployment all trickle down over time to our platform uh, design. Uh, when we look at uh, uh, status quo in existing sensor network platforms, uh, we <coughs> You know, see different approaches of how people are tackling uh, uh, these complex, this complexity in the environment. One good example is communication, uh, and uh, in particular, there are protocols out there now uh, that let you collect data with high reliability. In particular, uh, exam good example is uh, so-called collection data protocol (CTP), which is quite uh, famous in, in sensor net. Deployment, uh, which uh, was tested in a number of test beds uh, in many times, and there was uh, a comprehensive paper evaluating this protocol, which showed that 
you can receive all the data except for 0.1% from such networks uh, across, across the whole network. However, uh, the reason why this works is that uh, we are spending a lot of effort uh, in making this reliability happen in terms of estimating the link qualities uh, through control packets and using acknowledgements and a lot of retransmissions if, uh, if link fail. Um, so we do get uh, reliability but it's at a high cost in, in uh, communication. Uh, if you look at computation in sensor networks, the problem is even bigger. There is this, if you just do a survey of applications in sensor networks, you'll find out that there is this basic dichotomy of, there is this belief, uh, people believe that there is, you can have either low power deployment or high performance. You can't achieve both at the same time. Um, and the reason is that in, um, uh, the main focus has been to save energy. Uh, in terms of uh, the individual devices, and that's why people have selected low power MCUs. Uh, just uh, two examples uh, from Atmel and, and TI that limit the memory and code frequency of, of the MCU. And, uh, and the consequence of that was that most sensor network applications out there are limited to sense and send, or sense store and send applications, where you send something from the environment, you don't do any processing, and any complicated processing, and you just forward it to the base station and all the user process it. So these are the two basic problems that we were sort of looking at. Can we improve reliability without requiring the additional overhead, and can we break the dichotomy of low power or high performance uh, in a new sensor network platform? Now, if you look at the development cycle of a typical sensor network platform, you will find out that this is true whether it's a UCB, uh, UC, UC Berkeley, which was sort of behind uh, most of the development in sensor network platform, or the internal CIRA platform, <coughs> which was the improvement in, in, in terms of platform was mostly, um, mostly manufacturer driven. As the manufacturers, for example, Atmel came up with a better, faster MCU, or more memory, or uh, a 16-bit MCU, or similarly the radio, uh, as they were coming up with higher, uh, higher throughput and, and uh, uh, longer links, uh, the technology trickled down to the platform and was progressively being added. So what we looked at in this work was whether you can sort of break this uh, incremental approach uh, to improving existing platform, and you can do uh, more of a change, uh, more of a uh, sort of uh, one step higher improvement. <clears throat> and we looked at two basic areas. One of them was data processing, where we wanted to develop uh, an energy efficient platform that would be both low power, but also would allow you to do uh, uh, higher processing so that you can step beyond send, store, and uh, send applications. And in terms of data collection, we wanted to improve reliability of radio links and develop protocols that are inherently more reliable than the single chip solutions uh, that uh, are customer in sensor networks. So I'll talk about both of these areas briefly. Uh, I'll start with the data processing. There is a law that everyone in this room knows, which is the Morris law. Uh, which um, people mostly understand in terms of computation. Every two years, uh, the computation doubles um, in terms of uh, how many cycles per second, how many computations per second you can do. What's actually behind this law is that um, is that the density at which we can produce transistors uh, at the most cost-effective rate is doubling every year, <clears throat> every sort of every two years. And what that means is that the distances between components are getting shorter, you can run it at higher frequencies, the latencies are shorter, so the computation power doubles. What is the other aspect of this is uh, something that's uh, called Kumi's Law by Stanford uh, professor, uh, where people notice that by shrinking, by, by increasing the density of the transistor, we are shrinking the area of the MCU, and what it means is that you are 
uh, decreasing the energy that is um, uh, emitted, uh, that is dissipated by the area of the, of the dye, um, and uh, so we are improving energy efficiency. And so when uh, Kumi looked at the energy efficiency, he actually noticed that uh, at, fixed, at fixed computing load, the amount of battery that you need falls by a factor of two every one and a half years. So it's actually a bit faster <coughs> than the Bohr's law. Which leads to, you know, the explosion of mobile devices in the recent few years. Uh, what was even more interesting was that, uh, that Richard Feynman actually looked at the theoretical limits in 85. And he found that uh, an improvement of 100 billion, this was in 85, is possible in terms of the energy efficiency of the batteries. And so what that means is that we are still a long ways to go because since then we've only improved 40,000. Anyway, so uh, what I'm trying to get at is that uh, if you look at this curve from early MCUs through you know, laptops and probably mobile computers at the moment, you see this trend of improving efficiency. And so if you are not increasing the size, if you are not after computation, you can actually get uh, much better energy efficiency with today's devices than what we used to be able to do a few years ago. And what it necessarily leads to is that the modern 32-bit uh, MCUs will be eventually catching up with low-power MCUs in terms of energy efficiency. Um, and that's what we looked at. The problem is that for those low-power MCUs that were traditionally used in sensor networks, there isn't a whole uh, lot of funding for research. There is, uh, people are not doing as much progress as at modern MCUs. And uh, there are actually first 32-bit MCUs based, based on uh, ARM architecture that are almost beating the old style MCUs in terms of energy efficiency. And so what we took for Opal was one of these uh, chips, the uh, most energy efficient that we could find, and uh, we sort of compared uh, its performance to the old style uh, sensor network platforms. Uh, here is what we uh, arrived at. So MSP430 is, a, is an old style 16-bit processor used in a platform called TOSP. When you just look at the datasheet numbers, you'll find out that if you look at basic operations such as ADC sensor reading or logging uh, sensor data in the flash, uh, TELOS B is performing much better than the new uh, MCUs. It's you know 15 times using 15 times less energy. However, if you look at uh, other operations such as the sleep current that it achieves, it's much better, much fav more favorable. It's only four times as fast. And when you include the radio into the picture, that's basically consuming about the same uh, amount of energy on the two platforms. It's only uh, around one and a half times um, as bad. Um, so if you look at the current of the whole platform, which is, consists of measuring sensor data time to time, sleeping for the most part, checking radio occasionally, you'll find out that the two platforms are not too far from each other. So here we looked at the ratio of energy used by the new platform versus the old platform uh, for different parameters of how often you are sampling the sensor data and how often you are sampling the radio. The sampling of the sensors on the x-axis, the more to the right means you are sampling less and less. Um, and the uh, radio are different curves, so the lower you go, uh, the more often you're sampling the radio. Okay, and so for some typical values for radio sampling, which are these two curves, you see that as soon as you are requiring samples about half a minute, one sample about per half a minute, which most sensor network applications do, you quickly converge to something like being two times as bad uh, as, uh, as the old platforms, which is not too bad. So the new platforms you can implement low power sensing applications at only twice the cost of the old platforms, which was a good result. What you get in return is uh, energy efficiency at signal processing, at higher, uh, signal, uh, higher computationally intensive applications. And the reason for this is that they are implementing 32 bit processors, they're implementing uh, instructions, single cycle instructions that the old processors had to spend a lot of cycles. For example, 32-bit additional multiplication is one cycle, where a 16-bit processor will crunch, uh, will spend a lot of time crunching through the data. So what we looked at in, in these experiments was we looked at typical um, processing 
units that you use in your signal processing code if you wanted to process raw sensor data in something uh, uh, more sophisticated, such as Huffman encoding, FFT, linear regression, DCT, cross correlation operations like that. Now, you can group these operations based on whether they are dominated by 32 bit operations or whether they're using floating point data or dominated by the 8 bit operations, and they sort of uh, correspond to these classes. So, Huffman encoding did it on 8 bit data stream. So it was heavily 8-bit uh, dominated, and we had uh, floating point data operations and then the 32-bit operations. And we found that as we, start, as we try to do more and more computation, the platform, the new platform, actually starts outperforming the old platform by, by a number of uh, orders of magnitude. Uh, and uh, you not only get more energy efficient computations with the new platform, but you also speed up uh, in terms of time, of how long you ta it takes for you to do processing, so you'll be able to process more data in a given time. Okay, so I'm going to stay at this high level so that you guys don't fall asleep. Uh, and uh, I'm going to switch back to communication. It was the second problem that we tried to address. Can you yeah. back up one slide? Huh? Huh? Can you just go back to the previous slide? Yeah. So, I mean, there's clearly some inter interaction between this and the stuff you talked about before as far as sampling rates, right? Yeah. Because where are you going to get all this huge amount of data to process if you're sampling, you know, once every 30 seconds? So, you know, you, you know the, the, the higher power platforms are winning on the, you know, the big data sampling task, right? But they're also losing on the big data sampling task, right? Like, they'll do the processing, fine. So where's the crossover point there? Right, so I guess one way you can see that is that you could collect data in the flash right. and then do processing once every five minutes or something, or once every hour. Right, but then, but then just like the, the absolute, would, would, even uh, if you have a high factor, right, the absolute amount of power you're saving is still small. Yeah, it's a good question. Right, the it's other a good question, question is to see if there, is, if there is a sweet point somewhere right, right, right. Or for a given sampling frequency that would, uh, that would... I mean, the sampling frequency is going to dictate how much of a savings you're going to get based on what yeah, the computation is true. Yeah, that's what they're talking about. I guess the other thing I'm wondering is, I mean, is that there has been, I know the architecture, there have been people in the architecture community looking at accelerators for some of these operations that would be implemented to, you know, essentially kind of aug augment a, a, a more general purpose CD. So I mean, there's 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 something nice about using these these general purpose CPUs, right? But none of them are really optimized for these types of operations. You mean like um, you could use FPGAs or something like that to process? That? Well, no, you wouldn't use FPGA. You just you buy a chip that does help in the code, right? Mm. You know, like baked into the silicon, and like you know, if if you had, you know, a, a guy knew, you know, I don't know if you know Mark Humpstead, a friend of mine's been working on this a long time. He's like, you know, what accelerators would you want on your sensor network? No, like FFTs, for example, a very common operation. So you write a little hardware accelerator that does that. Mm -hmm. Well, then the question is, you know, these chips are commercial off the shelf available. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's going to be really cheap for you to put yeah. the platform together. I mean, one of the reasons is there is no, almost no cost difference between getting a Cortex chip and an all-star MSP430 chip. Right, right, yeah. So the question we are trying to ask, is the time now to switch? Or is there still a lot of benefit that the all low-power uh, MCs have? Yeah. And it looks like you sort of might be able to get both the best of the two worlds. Okay, so now I'll have a few more slides on uh, uh, how we address the communication reliability problem. So again, the problem is that uh, development in sort of the platform space was driven by manufacturers who are looking at improving data rates, improving the sensitivity of the receiver, which influences the communication range, but they rarely look beyond the physical, uh, physical link uh, layer. Uh, and uh, as we focus on layers above link layer to improve reliability of primary links. In particular, what we actually looked at was to include 
uh, multiple radios per sensor node we're operating in, in uh, different uh, frequency bands and we try to quantify what are the benefits of using uh, let's say 400, 900 and 2.4 gigahertz radio as opposed to just a single 2.4 uh, gigahertz chip. Uh, we also use spatial diversity, so spatially separated antennas of the different radios <coughs> and try to study how that helps. So just to uh, give you an overview of what is radio diversity and how does it help, uh, as I mentioned, spatial and uh, frequency diversity. Spatial diversity you can achieve by using multiple input um, antennas. Uh, you see that more and more. Jeff has uh, three antenna router at home. You know, so you basically almost can't get can't get routers with a single antenna anymore. Wi-Fi routers. So it's a commercial technology that's sort of overtaking uh, or taking over the the old design with a single antenna. Uh, chips oftentimes, even the small, cheap, low-cost uh, uh, devices or sensor networks or uh, sensor network type application, they already do provide support on the receiver end for auto automatic antenna selection uh, based on the signal quality. Similarly to frequency diversity, we are getting now routers, Wi-Fi routers that work both on 2.4 and 5 gigs and uh, can automatically select to a better radio link. Uh, you would see less of those trickling down uh, to the low power uh, world. Time diversity is actually part of most of the standards, for example, 15.4 spectrum modulation. Uh, and uh, so, why does the diversity help? Uh, there is this simple sort of conceptual idea if you have two links that your radio transmitter can select. Uh, to transmit data to a receiver. One of them has a reliability of P1, the other one of reliability of P2. The reliability at the receiver, if the, the losses are uncorrelated, if you send both packets at the same time, is uh, calculating according to this formula. So if you have a 90 percent reliable link, uh, the one of the joint probability of success will be 99 percent. So that is a basic conceptual <coughs> idea of why uh, your diversity will help you in improving your uh, reliability, overall reliability of the radio. Now, we tried that, so I mentioned Opal. If uh, Opal platform has multiple radio chips that operate on different frequencies with spatially separated antennas. We just tried basic experiments to see how does the reliability help. So here, in, uh, we sort of sampled for different locations in the lab. Uh, we sampled packet uh, loss rate packet reception ratio uh, and on this graph we are plotting with the blue color when 2.4 megahertz was performing at 100 percent so all packets were proof and 900 megahertz band was performing at zero percent okay the red one is the other way around and the green one was the two, two bands performed in, in a single way uh, and so you see that there is a lot of interesting areas. There are areas where 2.4 band performs much better than the 900 band. There is a point right next to that point where it sort of flips. It gives an intuition that uh, for small spatial distances, there is a significant difference into which, uh, into how the individual bands are performing. So that hinted at us that both frequency and spatial diversity are important. We also repeated a similar experiment in an open space. We were just driving a car over one and a half kilometers uh, with uh, two antennas on the roof. And from GPS location uh, of the car, we then put together this graph where again, on, um, <clears throat> well, it's really hard to see, but there is a green graph showing that 900 is performing better, blue graph and 2.4. Uh, sorry, the green graph shows uh, reliability of the 900 blue graph of 2.4 but the red one is the difference which is the important one uh, so if the red one is above uh, the zero that means 900 is performing better if it's below it means 2.4 is performing better and you see that there is a lot of variation depending on your, on your distance from the receiver <coughs> uh, you'll see that uh, but that only matters in a certain certain area or certain distances where the signal strength is low enough to be influenced a lot by the environmental interference, but it's not too low for you to lose connectivity completely. 
Uh, but this area was sort of large, you know, it was sort of 400 meters where uh, you could improve by selecting the right link, you could improve by almost 100% uh, reliability in many of these places. So these are sort of motivational one hoc scenarios where uh, we were able to demonstrate that both frequency and spatial diversity are important. Uh, what we then implemented was, so I mentioned the collection data tree protocol, which basically uh, implements uh, a multi hop data collection from a sense static sensor network to a single route, where each node is con continuously estimating the best parent through which uh, to send the data over to the base station, and uh, each node forwards on the behalf of the nodes behind it uh, to the base station. We implemented this protocol using multiple radios, so the nodes were not only selecting uh, the best suitable parent, they were also selecting the best suitable radio um, uh, for the transmission. And uh, we deployed this uh, on, on our campus, so this is the uh, sort of floor plan of our campus. It has multiple buildings, up to 15 buildings, it has a forest area, there is a hill with the radar tower, we have the hot metal carriers moving around as I mentioned. <clears throat> so it's a challenging environment with a lot of areas where you don't have line of sight between the two nodes. Uh, now for the same deployment, we tested uh, the network were operating uh, only with 900 megahertz radios, only with 2.4 megahertz radios and the dual band, and we were able to get quite a big improvement, so the 900 megahertz links lost about 30% of all the packets, 2.4% better, but the dual band was able to get almost all the packets through at a lower total cost. Um, so this was an exciting result was published in IPSM. Uh, what we looked then uh, after, so after this work was how to improve energy efficiency of this protocol. Okay, so the disadvantage, of, so here we demonstrated that we can improve the reliability of the data collection quite a lot. Now, you need to run two radios, so if you implement it in an IE way, you need to pay double the energy for running both radios at the same time. So we had a follow-up work that looked at whether we can improve the energy consumption of the dual radio versus single radio systems. Um, and uh, so we looked at uh, something called low power listening, uh, make protocols. Uh, so the, the way how you typically address energy usage in sensor networks or similar type systems is that uh, instead of, so if you want two nodes to communicate, both of the nodes have to have their radios on, one of them needs to be in transmission mode, the other one in the reception mode. That's very energy consuming because your receiver needs to keep its radio on at all times. How is this typically addressed in uh, so-called uh, um, low power listening protocols is that the receiver turns this radio on for a very short period, periodically. Okay, so, so the node is sleeping, not consuming any energy, then it wakes up for a little bit, turns its radio on, puts it in the receiver mode. If it doesn't receive any packet, it goes back to sleep. If it receives packet, it receives the packet and goes back to sleep. So this lets you save a lot of energy on the receiver at the cost of the transmitter needs to transmit the packet for at least as long as the distance between the two uh, radio check intervals on the receiver. So we sort of pay more for the transmissions, but we save a lot of energy on the receiver. Okay, so when we enabled this uh, low power listening protocol in our dual radio implementation, we observed that, um, uh, so this was the data. So this is, the table is showing an overhead of the dual radio versus the single radio. If the low power listening was not enabled, we got 50 percent and more overhead. If we enabled it, we got around 33 percent, which decreased with the increasing number of packets, decreased to uh, almost zero. But there was still some overhead for you know one packet per second type duty uh, cycles, around 22 to 25 percent for uh, typical low power listening settings. Um, so what we then looked at was we tried to find what is the inefficiency of the low power uh, listening protocol. Where is this overhead coming from? And uh, what we find out is that the receiver node needs to be running the two radios at the same time. What we observed in the field was that actually most of the time only one radio was being used. That's the radio that had a better link and that changed only very rarely in time. 
uh, if there was some external interference or something that has changed, the links sometimes split. But when we looked at distribution of when band one, uh, radio one versus radio two was used, it was pretty much binary. So the idea is between four or nine hundred. So what in effect it meant was that one of the radios was almost never used, and yet the node kept checking whether there is transmission on the radio. So the improvements that we did was we uh, uh, implemented a way uh, to check, to in adaptively increase the radio check intervals, uh, and along with some other optimizations where we let the transmitter to estimate when the receiver is waking up and to delay the transmission until that time, we were able to bring down the energy or to increase the energy efficiency of this protocol. And when we compared uh, single radio operations with the dual radio operations, out of single the protocol that we uh, developed, we could see that with the dual radio, we were actually able to improve the energy consumption of a single radio uh, by some amount in terms of mean energy and maximum energy as well. Your maximum energy typically defines your lifetime. Okay, so I've talked for 50 minutes, time to conclude. Uh, so I looked at, uh, initially I gave you an overview of, of a couple of recent projects that are motivating some of our platform work. Um, at CSIRO, uh, I presented a couple of sort of conclusions on the modern MCUs uh, that let you be, uh, they are almost as uh, energy efficient as all low power uh, MCUs, but let you do uh, signal processing at higher energy efficiency. And in communication, I have shown that uh, uh, it is possible to improve reliability by implementing uh, radio link diversity in such a net platform. <coughs> and uh, improved reliability not necessarily requires higher energy usage that you can implement uh, your network stack in a way that uh, the overhead of multiple radios is just the cost of the hardware, it's not the energy cost of running the additional device. Okay, so that concludes the talk. I have a we have a couple of publications that I can share with you, and a lot of uh, contributing uh, other labs that contributed to some of the software for, for Cortex and Freebase uh, platforms in, uh, in Tiny US or on the low power sensing, low power listening protocol and protocols. Happy to take 15 minutes of questions. <laughs> Only 15 minutes. <laughs> In low power listening mode, how do you decide that uh, which node is uh, referred and which node is uh, transferring? And which node is transmitter? Yes. It is this word, decide statically or uh, are you deciding that dynamically? So typically, so you have a large network of nodes deployed. The base station is predefined. It's a stationary node that's sitting somewhere in the field. Okay. Then all the rest of the nodes, imagine that's a climate monitoring network. So every other node is periodically measuring some data and then transmitting power to base station. So each of the nodes is transmitter at some point in time, transmits data down to base station. And if it can talk to the base station directly, then the node is transmitter, the base station is receiver. If it requires another node for forwarding the packet, then the other nodes will become receiver first and then when forwarding it becomes transmitter. So it's not statically predefined because the network, the data collection network, which is the graph through which you are sending the data towards the root, can be changing over time. Uh, but each node at some point becomes a transmitter and most of the time it needs to forward some data for other nodes as well and it becomes a receiver. Oh, uh, I was just curious if you'd uh, looked at uh, having the nodes coordinate uh, their receiver periods as well. Um, presumably you could, if you have three nodes sitting around the base station, you could each give them a third of the... You mean TDMA like time division multiple access? Yeah, that's what I mean. 
Okay. He doesn't know the radio lingo. But... No. <laughs> okay, yeah, so um, people try this approach. It's, it's hard to coordinate with sensor networks. So typically, what the energy that is spent for coordinations, even the low rates at which you are sending the data, typically outweigh the benefit that you gain. So typically, the channel capacity is not a problem. We are sending way less data than the channel capacity. So the way how the collisions are solved is in Oh, it, it, I'm not talking about uh, collisions. I'm, I'm talking about, uh, so one of the problems you mentioned here is uh, figuring out, uh, having the node uh, be active and in receive mode when one of the other nodes is, is trying to send to the, mm -hmm. the base station, I guess. Yeah. Um, have you considered having the nodes sort of coordinate to, to try and figure out when other nodes will be trying to receive. Right, so that was that was this part that I sort of went too quickly through. It's actually been proposed by other people as well. Yes, yeah, so what you can do, I'm gonna go back here so that Yeah, so what happens here is that if the node one is the transmitter, okay, so if it has no idea when the receiver will wake up, then it will just transmit, start transmitting when the packet becomes available and it will transmit uh, until it's acknowledged by the receiver. Okay? Yes, but now let's say you have node 3 um, the, and both node 2 and node 3 are closer to the base station than node 1 or at least have a, a lower, uh, have a higher chance of contacting the base station. Uh, would node 2 try to coordinate with node 3? So in the basic implementation, no. There was an extension that was actually published last year in IPSN where the first node that wakes up will acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. And if it makes at least some improvement towards the base station, so each node has an estimate of how much effort it takes to transmit packets from each location to the base station. So how many hops on average it takes for a packet to get there. Right? Okay. So if you have two nodes, one of them can be actually further away from the base station than the other. So, but what these guys, so that's why you always select the best one to go through and you have to wait until it wakes up. What these guys did was, whoever wakes up the first will acknowledge it as long as it makes some progress towards the base station. Uh, and uh, they've, they've made some improvement over the space of the course. But what I was trying to get at um, before sort of jumped into me Sorry. It was that there is a, another protocol, it's called Weissman. That's a bit smarter. So the first time, you start transmitting when you know, have no idea when this node is waking up. You start transmitting when the packet becomes available. But then you can record the time when the node is actually acknowledged. From the known uh, byte payload length, you can estimate when it woke up. Um, and uh, you can remember that time. And this period is typically static, so it's 512 milliseconds. So you can then estimate of when the node is waking up. And the next time around you have a bucket, you wake up just before this node wakes up. And you say that, and that's been probably, it's called WiseMag, it's probably one of the most efficient protocols in sensor, and the problem is they never made it public, so no one can use it, no one can test against it, it's a uh, proprietary protocol. But yes, that's what we are actually ended up implementing in our dual radio protocol, and that's what helped us to improve our single radio. Thanks. Yeah, so I was wondering if flying foxes, uh, do they, like some birds, uh, use magnetism for navigation and was that a consideration for making sensors? Good question. I don't think they do. I think um, they mostly use visual clues. I don't think the ecologists are, uh, understand them to say for sure not. Uh, but I don't think the sensors um, have, uh, have high enough uh, uh, create high enough magnetic field to disturb. I know they were deploying GPS tags with um, satellite transmitters on pigeons, and pigeons clearly use the, the, those are one of the birds that are known to use magnetic fields for navigation. And uh, I think they haven't found uh, that the pigeons would have a bigger problem with navigation in, with the colors on. But also the thing with pigeons is like allegedly, it only affects, it only makes a difference if it's cloudy. Because if it's not cloudy, they'll use the sun. And if it uh -huh. is cloudy, then if you, if you tie a magnet to their back or whatever, uh -huh. it only bothers it them. them. Only when it's cloudy. Only when it's cloudy. So yeah, uh -huh. that's what I was like. 
when GPS doesn't work well when it is cloud. It doesn't? No. Oh, I think it does. Not always. Okay. That's another cool thing to look at. <laughs> you never assume that there, there will be any problems with cloud and GPS. Can I go back to the processor stuff? Oh, you can't give up anything. No. <laughs> So I mean, I, I feel like there's, I mean, what, what you guys, maybe this is a false choice. That's my question. For the 32-bit cortex? Yeah, I mean, why not both? I mean, I, th I think throughout my, I think this is, this is always an interesting question, right? Because throughout my experience with sensor networks, there's always been this problem, I think, where people will have a difficult time putting a monetary price on reliability or maintenance. So for example, here you have this power consumption issue, right? You're talking about a factor of two, so that's actually a lot of site visits, right? I mean, that's twice as many, right? We're going to change batteries or do maintenance or something. There's some maintenance costs associated with, with battery draw. Then factor of two is kind of a big deal, right? So, you know, why not say we're going to double, we're going to use cost components, right? But we're going to increase the price of each node by 50%. You would like a dual CPU solution? Yeah, I'd like an M3, and then I'd also like the the ISA, the, the ISA compatible, whatever, whatever. They, they have a, the, another one in the same line, right? It uses a subset of the ARM ISA, runs at even lower power. Mm -hmm. So that way, you know, you don't have to, because essentially, you know, what these numbers show is that the more the higher power processors are better at processing, right? And the lower power processors are better at not processing. Right. They're better at doing stupid little things like servicing hardware, right? Like yeah. grabbing a sample and going back yeah. to it, right? So why not, you know, use them both for what they're doing? Possibly. Your OS would have to support it. It's probably much more difficult to implement support for dual CPU than dual radios. Yeah, maybe. But I, but I feel like it's interesting because, like, you, you feel the sensor network community kind of trying to, to build up into these higher power processors. Mm -hmm. I think mobile devices, I mean, are also going up, but they'd also like to go down, right? I mean, because there's the sleep states for phone processors aren't as low as you would want, right? Mm -hmm. So phones might want a lower power, you know, CPU. Sensor numbers might want a higher power one. Then you have a common set of challenges, which is how you manage this um, potentially yeah. slightly more heterogeneous set of devices. Mm -hmm. And you enter all these discussions of what are you actually going to be running on the ARM CPU. Are you going you would be much better at running Linux. You wouldn't have to need, need to compile stuff for some weird language such as tiny pet. Oh yeah, no, that's you that's fine. Your open C V and file, right, right, sure. right? Yeah. And use your mode as a as a low power wake up device. Yeah. Something like that. Problem with Linux is that it's using a lot of RAM. Yeah. And you need to refresh that. So you get either a latency problem or buffering that from the flash or high energy consumption right. and turn it off completely. So that was the argument for using Tiny OS. Yeah, the first one. Um, but yeah, probably you could beat it. I mean, one issue is that when you look at the platform as such, it's rarely, it's, its sleep current is rarely limited by the MCU. Mm -hmm. You have voltage regulators and voltage sure. and hardware that I don't understand. Yeah. So it's probably when you look at the platform sleep current, it's going to be way less different there than yeah. just when you're looking at the MCUs. No, sure, but you, you usually don't care that much about the, the, really the sleep current. You care about the you know the, the busy sleep current. Right? Like how much power does it take to get up and grab a sample, or get up and decide if I need to vibrate something. There are refreshments upstairs. Three ten. I think now in three ten. So does anyone else have any other questions? I was just wondering if you if you consider the availability of energy in each node, like let's say if a node is about to die or for routing. Yeah, so that you can make some decisions dynamically or something. Like no, that. we haven't. But that's what Jeff looked at in his PhD, right? Yeah. <laughs> what a mess. <laughs> um, well, we just decided to get off the multi-hot problem now together. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, we, we, did some, we did some work looking at, um, at trying to utilize, trying to route around energy holes in the network. 
things like that. And it, it turns out that there, you could, there are some wins there that you can get. Right? It's not, I, I still think it's a clever idea. <laughs> I gave up on trying to convince other people about it. But, yeah, so there, there is, and there's a, there's a lot of other energy aware about their work, right? Um, it, it, in general, it's, it can be difficult to, I think there's a lot of extra forecasting and prediction you have to be able to do before you can really decide I mean, essentially, what you're what you're trying to say, and this is the argument I was trying to make for a while, is that it's better to spend more power, but to spend more power at devices that have more power. Um, the problem is that I don't just my intuition is that's not true that often. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, in sensor networks in general, when you're power constrained to this level, spending as little power as possible is almost always the right thing to do. Right? Sometimes you might start to worry about where power is in the network, right? Because power is not transferable. But in general, the shorter routing path with better quality links wins almost every time. You have to see some pretty significant uh, energy disparities in towards it. Also, probably gets more complicated once you start harvesting and the different nodes harvest at different rates. Har har yeah, harvesting makes it in, in some ways a little bit more interesting though, because you can get into a steady state. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you ma imagine a network where every node is harvesting at a different rate, and then you also overlay some sort of reliability topology on top of it, right? You know, there's a close. There's probably depending on your traffic pattern, there's a closed form solution for an optimal routing tree, right? That respects both the char charging rates, right, and the data traffic rates, and essentially optimizes some metric, right? Whether it's the overall you know, weighted uptime of the network or something else, or delivery ratios or something. Uh, in some level, in, in our work, we were always trying to make the argument that you were going to do solar power charging. Because mm -hmm. if you're not, then who cares? The network's going to run out of power eventually, right? You know? uh, so. Okay. Right. Let's take our speaker again.